Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this morning, today's gospel from Mark chapter 10. In the name of Jesus, amen. Has there ever been a country in the history of the world where people had what we have today? No one has ever enjoyed the confluence of luxury, convenience, and overall quality of living that we have in this place and time. We are the wealthiest people in the world. Even the poorest of us lives as standards most people in the world can only dream of. 62% of people in the world have never used a cell phone. Most live with the barest of necessities. Many countless millions have no idea what it means to live in a free society. Yet in our country, we can't get enough. Who wants to be a millionaire has millions of people watching other people guess their way to wealth. Why is it so popular? Well, who doesn't want to be a millionaire? And this is nothing new. There have been people consumed by the idea of wealth as long as there have been people and wealth. Take the young man we see coming to Jesus in our text. Most likely he had servants, land, business, a nice home, and money to spare. Great possessions, the Bible calls it. This rich young man, probably rich because of his family, no doubt had the best in religious training, private tutors in Hebrew, Torah, and so on. Maybe he'd even toyed with the idea of becoming a Pharisee one day. But something intrigued him about the fame and notoriety that surrounded Jesus. So he came and asked Jesus this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Seeing through to the heart, however, Jesus pointed out that those trusting in riches would have a hard time entering the kingdom of God. What if there were an earthquake today or a hurricane or some other disaster and you lost everything you own? What if you became like Job? Job was quite wealthy in his day and he lost everything in one day, including his family. What would you do? What lessons would you learn? What Job learned was that God is greater than his possessions. In fact, God is greater than life itself. I wonder if we get that. Survey was done a number of years ago and some interesting things were discovered. Did you know, for instance, that when it comes to the offering, people today give less percentage-wise than the people in our churches did during the Great Depression. The study also reveals that the elderly are by far our greatest givers. Did you know that? They're not the best earners, but they are by by far the best givers. And what's the number one thing that most congregations argue about? It's not the sermons, it's not the hymns, it has nothing to do with anything in the Bible. You know what it is. It's money. Could you say we've lost our focus? When people's personal wants and desire take precedence 
over their drive to support the proclamation of the gospel, and their craving for the acquisition of things outpaces their passion for the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting, when their quibbling over finances makes them unwilling to forgive family, friends, and their brothers and sisters in Christ, you bet we've lost our focus. And we better be careful. For where our treasure is, there will our hearts be also. The young man in our text thought he was perfect at keeping the law of God. But when it came to his heart, he couldn't let go of his wealth and follow Jesus. To this, Jesus responded, It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were greatly astonished at this, saying to themselves, Who then can be saved? We could look at ourselves and ask the same question. Haven't we all been cheap toward God with our time, talent, and treasure? Shoot, we give more to the government than we, do, than we give to God. I don't know whether to say shame on the government or shame on us. Probably a little of both. Who then can be saved? That's the question the disciples asked. And the answer was, it is not those who put their trust in wealth or power, but those who trust in God, for with God all things are possible. And the rich young man went sorrowfully away. You know what his problem really was? He was unwilling to let God be God in his life. He was worshiping a very different God, really. And you know what? Sometimes, so do we. But what a puny God this other God is. What an empty God and faith for those who trust in mammon. Did you ever want something so badly, but once you got it, it didn't seem to have the same appeal? How incapable this God is in providing any lasting joy and satisfaction. Here, Jesus exposes a truth about us. That we often place our luxury and comfort, our worship of things, ahead of the one true God. Often we're more concerned about the health of our bodies than we are the well-being of our souls. We'll lust after that dream home, that perfect car, the boat, the lake cottage, and who knows what all else, more than we care about God, or other people for that matter. I've seen hobbies become a religion for some people. Work often provides the same excuse. Even churchliness can become a religion unto itself. Luther told the monks and nuns of his day to get out of the monasteries and convents and stop thinking that they were serving God by sitting around saying prayers all day. He said, you want to serve God? Get out and serve your fellow man. We've become so skilled at fighting an escape from the reality that Jesus wants all of us not just part of me, all of me. Thank God we have a Lord who transcends money, wealth, and self-indulgence. He left the luxury of heaven and came here to serve mankind. He wasn't interested in who was richer, he didn't choose sides in personality clashes or family squabbles. He loved everyone equally. 
And he wants us to follow in his footsteps. He wants us to follow him. The rich young man lacked faith. Faith in Jesus, faith that Jesus was God, faith that puts self-interest aside and follows. Faith that takes hold of the hand of God and lets God worry about the future. It's a difficult question, and the answer isn't easy. But we have to ask ourselves, does my life reflect God's economy or my own? Do I serve God or mammon? And how will I know which one I'm actually serving? Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. You see, no matter how much you sacrifice in God's economy, he replaces what you lose a hundred times over, even if those blessings are mixed with persecutions. He offers a life free from slavery to stuff. Why be bound to your stuff? Why worry and fret over things that are temporary when Christ offers so much more if we simply trust in him? Sure, we might suffer in the short term. Jesus certainly did. It took going to the cross to make atonement for sins. But look at the payoff. A short time of suffering on his part. And he gained forgiveness and eternal salvation for all of humanity. It's not that the other things aren't important. I get that. You do need money. You, you do need possessions. Otherwise, you'd be hungry, naked, and homeless. But it's a matter of putting first things first. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Understanding the proper order puts things in better perspective. When we're not dependent upon things for security or fulfillment, we're not so desperate when we don't have them. When we trust God for our needs of body and soul, we're less possessive of what we have, more free to be generous, more willing to forgive. For we recognize that everything we have comes from him, and he's not likely to run out of resources anytime soon. So we can give more freely from the heart and with joy, knowing that there's more where that came from. So what will it be? Will you leave here today sorrowful and sad because your life, your peace, your happiness is dependent on things rather than God? When asked by Jesus to take up your cross and follow him, will you walk away despondent and downcast? Or does the gospel mean more to you than the possessions you own? Be honest. Wouldn't you rather go home today forgiven and renewed, blessed and full of hope in Christ? Beloved, the good news of Jesus Christ is that we are free from slavery to our stuff. Having things is nice. We can even consider them gifts from God. But let's remember who our master is. 
the one who bled, died, and rose again to make us a people for his own possession, destined not to serve the things of this world, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you with faith and trust that goes beyond materialism and mammon, a faith that empowers you to take up your cross and follow your Savior, freely giving and forgiving for Jesus' sake. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.